Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. And today we have somebody who's come to visit us all the way from Australia. His name is Steve Tultz. He has written a novel with a strange title to me, A Fraction of the Whole. And uh, the wonderful people at Spiegel and Growl are the publishers. Thank you for coming by. Thank you very much for having me. You know, I think I have to begin with uh, something that ran in Newsweek uh, in January. And uh, it's, it's called 20 People Who Will Shape the Nation in 2008. And you made this list. Yeah, it's very unusual. I mean, if you have a look who else is on the list, um, there's uh, David Hicks, who is, I don't know if you know him, but he's a famous Australian terrorist who spent a lot of time in Guantanamo Bay. So it's a, it's an interesting <laughs> list. It's it's it's. Um, I'm Your not quite sure. Your buddy from Australia. Exactly. I'm not quite sure what it means. And of course, um, this ran actually ran in a magazine that yeah yeah um, in Australia. January. And it says here of you, uh, described by his Australian publisher Penguin Ben Ball as a book you could spend thirty years looking for. Tulsa's A Fraction of the Whole will be the literary topic du jour on its release in March. There you are. And the Sydney screenwriter's debut about the dysfunctional relationship between father and son is a witty 700-page romp, which has a uh, cult written all over it. I don't know what that means. It will be published simultaneously in the UK and the US, where Publishers Weekly has already described it as a sprawling, dizzy, dizzying debut. What a welcome. I mean, I can't do any better than that. No, look, it's very nice. I, I don't know, you know, right away you should go to cult. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah, look, I don't know how these things come about. I mean, it feels like it's happening in a sort of parallel universe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that the word in, in, in all that uh, uh, stuff that Newsweek said that I want to focus on is the word dysfunctional family. Uh, Jasper Dean, who mainly tells the family story uh, and, and, and lives it. He's one of the dysfunctional Deans. His uncle, Terry Dean, is what is somewhere in the book he's described as a martyr criminal, mm -hmm. which is an interesting kind of thing. And uh, Jasper's uh, father, uh, Martin, uh, who uh, is a man who spends his life, I think, wanting to make a lasting mark on the world. Yes. And the way, the way uh, uh, people talk about each other in this book is absolutely different. One thing's for sure, not writing about my father, this is Jasper, would take a mental effort that's beyond me. All my non-dad thoughts feel like transparent strategies to avoid thinking about him. And why should I avoid it anyway? My father punished me for existing, and now it's my turn to punish him for existing. It's only fair. This is quite a family. Yeah, look, it is quite a family. Um, of course, uh, Martin is, is uh, Jasper's father, is the most uh, hated man in Australia. And uh, his uncle, Jess, uh, Martin's brother, is uh, the most adored man in Australia. So Jasper's kind of caught in, in between these two figures. Well, and if one were to say why uh, uh, Terry is, is adored, I mean, one would not think very highly of Australia. I mean, he at one time has killed more people and done more damage around the country than anybody in the history of the country, and he's very much adored. Well, we, we, are, um, we come from a land of... Of criminals, and we do have a propensity <laughs> in Australia. <laughs> I mean, um, there is a habit in Australia of um, making heroes out of certain types of um, violent criminals, uh, such as um, Ned Kelly, or yeah. more recently um, Chopper Reed. I don't know if you know him. You say, um, well, the other the other point that you make in the book, which I think is very very important, is that people who commit heinous crimes become heroes because of the media. Yeah. And that's really not just part of your society in Australia. <laughs> it's our society. Mm -hmm. we, may have be, we may be the creators of that idea. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. One of Martin's efforts to make a lasting mark on the world, and, and all of them, it seems to me, explode in his, in his face, 
is the suggestion box. Mm. What is the suggestion box? Well, Martin has um, an idea that he would like to improve the people of his town. He would like he would he would like everybody to, um, I guess, be better people and to to have more of a um, more of an interest in in expanding their own potential in their own lives. And so he has this idea of building a, a suggestion box that the people of the town could put in suggestions and perhaps somehow improve their lives. And, of course, it all goes terribly wrong. The publisher says that uh, a fraction of the whole is epic. And I guess it's epic in several ways. The many lands it takes us to, the big adventures, and the use of a single word that's two lines long. Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. A Fraction of the Whole, that's the title of the book. It's a novel by Steve Toltz from Australia, published by Spiegel and Grau, which is yet another division of Random House. Yeah, that's right. And is there a Spiegel and Grau in Australia too, or... No, no, it's just it's just a New York-based company. It should be also in Germany, shouldn't it? I, never mind. You think? <laughs> One of the people who got to this book early is somebody at Esquire magazine, uh, which uh, person, it is unidentified, says in part, a fraction of the whole is that rarest of long books, utterly worth it. Almost true, I think. The year is only two months old, but this is the book of a two-month year. It may well carry the whole thing. The story starts in a prison cell and ends up on a plane, and there is not one forgettable episode in between. It reads like Mark Twain with access to an intercontinental Airbus. And I was thinking also maybe drugs, but no, it doesn't say. It's an episodic story, a kite strung with... Now I'll change the word with mind games. Okay. Pretty good change. Right. This book <laughs> moves. It bucks and rocks in a world that feels more than a hemisphere away. All 544 pages, it got shortened since Newsweek, mm -hmm. are so comical and inviting that you have no choice but to step forward into its icy wake. That's quite a send-off. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, uh, the Esquire points out there's not one forgettable episode, but uh, some of them are more memorable than others, and I want to get to one of those. But first, I, I do want to get to this uh, uh, two-line two word. Mm -hmm. Now, this word occurs when Jasper is uh, um, beginning to have a nice relationship with a, a woman who's, who's called the Towering Inferno. That's right. She's Mostly because of her height and her red hair. Yeah, that's right. Thank you very much. She was only inches away. I couldn't breathe. I was experiencing one of those, and here's the word, horrible, beautiful, terrifying, disgusting, wondrous, insane, unprecedented, euphoric, sensational, disturbing, thrilling, hideous, sublime, nauseating, exceptional feeling. Why did you do that? <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, you know, sometimes just one word is not enough um, to describe. <laughs> the Unless you make it long enough. <laughs> Unless you sort of have to make up your own. The English language can sometimes be be limiting in those kind of yeah. circumstances. And it, um, yeah, this is that's the only way he could think to describe. And this this occurs at, at page three twelve of a book that we now know is only five hundred odd pages, not seven. Mm -hmm. And by the time you're there, uh, you say, oh, yeah, fine. This is the kind of thing that this guy would say. So uh, <laughs> it, 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 it really fits. It, it, it's a wonderful, it's oh, a good you. laughing moment. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, the, the, one of the very unforgettable uh, episodes that uh, uh, is involved here is, is, is kind of a business of biting the hand that feeds you. Mm -hmm. You talk about getting a book published here. Mm. A and the title of the book is A Textbook on Crime. That's right. And the author is a fellow named Harry, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. whom the, the two uh, boys found as a mentor, mm-hmm. the man in prison they found as, as a mentor. Mm-hmm. And uh, Harry wants to get this book published. What happens? Well, yeah, so he's written the um, Handbook of Crime, which is a textbook instructing um, wannabe criminals how to break the law. And um, so he and Martin go out and try to get it published. And uh, they do. Um, well, they found a guy, Stanley. Stanley, they find a who, publisher. Who literally has nothing else to publish. Yes. So he decides to publish it. Yeah. Yes. But he does something weird that screws everything up. He does. He puts. Uh, he, well, he doesn't believe that. He doesn't believe that uh, Harry is actually the author because Martin's brother is Terry Dean, who is the infamous um, martyr vigilante, criminal. Martyr <laughs> criminal. And for the sake of sales, he puts his name, Terry's name, on the book. On the book. Now everything breaks loose. Harry gets despondent, and he goes up on a bridge. Yeah, on the Harbour Bridge. Yes. And in order, in order to, uh, in order to kill himself, and uh, he does accomplish that. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, uh, our our friend, the real hot criminal, holds up in a bowling alley, and while he's in the bowling alley, he makes love to two or three groupies and bowls a strike. <laughs> this is the kind of book it is. There are adventures in in here that. Go over the top. And to say that they go over the top is not to give them sufficient due. And I love the scene in the bowling alley. And it was really memorable. <laughs> you can't forget it. A, for, a fraction of the whole is a wash with great stories. When we, all, when we come back, we're going to look at one more and a character I find totally evil. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. I'm Jim Foster. A Fraction of the Whole, a novel by Steve Toltz is what we're talking about today. And uh, Booklist has some very nice things to say about it. They call it this hilarious, sneaky, smart first novel, and it's all of those, is as big and rangy as Australia. That's called hyperbole, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yes. Tolts uh, salts it all with uproarious ruminations on freedom, the soul, love, death, and the meaning of life. This is one rampaging and irresistible debut. I do want to talk about the fact that I think all the characters except one in this book, I think, have a marvelous balance of good traits and bad traits, good and evil, if you will, with the exception of Eddie. Yeah. And Eddie is Martin Dean, Jasper's father's best friend. Yes. Where did you dig him up from? He's evil. He evil. Is. Well, I wanted a character that was... Um that could go as that far, that could go um, all the way. Because for, for a lot of the book, Eddie is sort of, sort of slightly mysterious. He's Martin's, as you said, he's Martin's best friend. Um, and although they're very different characters and um, while Martin is kind of pale and woman slightly weak and ugly and Eddie is this kind of very healthy healthy man who... And um, just and, he, says, and the other thing about him in in the plot, if you will, mm-hmm. is that that he's he's also helpful. He's also he, like, he's, he he's, comes becomes Johnny on the spot at various moments, and you know, yeah, helps they don't everybody. quite understand why. But Eddie follows them around the world and just helps them out whenever they whenever they need it. Now, toward the end of the novel, and there's parts of this that I don't want to mention because I think they should be discovered. Mm -hmm. But toward the end of the novel, Eddie shows how totally evil he is. It it turns out that he's trained as a doctor. Yeah. And his parents wanted him to, you know, take over a practice in Thailand. Mm -hmm. 
and that doesn't happen. So he finds a different way to get the practice. Tell mm. us what that way is. Well, Eddie spent um, you know five years in medical school, and his uh, whole meaning of his life is dependent upon him becoming a doctor. And he goes back to the village where uh, he grew up, where his father was the doctor. But unfortunately for Eddie, there is an already a doctor who has taken all the business in town, and Eddie um, Eddie has to either wait for the doctor to die, or um, he's going to jump in there and take over himself. And he creates a vacancy. He, yeah, yeah, he creates he crea- a vacancy. He, that's pretty good, isn't it? He creates a vacancy. Exactly. And, and, but when I got to that part of the book, and I have to say at this point that there, there are so many laughs in this book. There are so many moments that you, you, you send up society and you send up morals and you send up mores. You know, it's a great effect, entertaining and, and, and educational all at the same time. When I got to this part of the book where Eddie, you know, takes uh, front stage, mm-hmm. uh, I wrote down in, in, in my notes, is this book really a, a story about good versus evil? Is that at bottom what we're talking about? Um, I don't think so. Not, not for me. I think, um, I think that, that this is just a way for, uh, for a character to... to um, go to extremes, but all of the characters are they're really there to inform Jasper and Martin. Um, and they're all, as the book is called, a fraction of the whole. Each character is a, is a fraction of perhaps one person and it is the story of a father and the son. But as I was writing it also, I considered that perhaps it isn't the story of the father and son, perhaps it's just the story of one person and all these characters are, are just parts. <laughs> This is getting more and more intriguing as we as we go on. Now, the final effort Marty has, Martin, the father has, to uh, make his mark in the world is to make everyone in Australia a millionaire. Mm. And the incredible part of it is that that's whacked out kind of idea. It works. Mm. And then, like everything else that Martin tries, it explodes. That's right. And, 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 and causes great... Hardship and, and 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 suffering. Well, it's a very simple idea that he has, and that's um, if everyone in Australia, if we have twenty million people, everybody sends in one dollar, uh, then every week, twenty million people can become millionaires. Isn't that simple? Isn't that well? We got we got a lot of people in this country. You could do it too. You could make yeah, two hundred and fifty million. Should, should we start working on this? I think you should. Hey, there are a lot of things to learn in this in this big epic of a novel. And one of the things you can learn is how to laugh and how to have an enjoyable time reading it. It's called A Fraction of the Whole, the author Steve Tulse. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Thank you very much. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C O C or send an email to jimfostercoc at gmail.com.